Support for this podcast comes from Sonovate, the leading provider of finance and payment solutions for the contingent workforce. If you're placing contractors in the UK or overseas, Sonovate's technology and funding can help you unlock your working capital. Whether you're a large recruitment business or just starting up, with Sonovate, managing your contractors' payments has never been easier, allowing you to focus on expanding your business. Don't let payment deadlines hold you back. Trust Sonovate to keep your funds in place and your business growing. Find out more at www.sonovate.com. That's www.sonovate.com. There's been more of scientific discovery, more of technical advancement and material progress in your lifetime and mine than in all the ages of history. Hi there, this is Matt Alder. Welcome to episode 510 of the Recruiting Future podcast. Over the last decade or so, we finally realised that the candidate experience isn't a one-off project. It's an ever-evolving theme that constantly runs through talent acquisition. Strategy, measurement and continuous improvement are critical. So what's the current state of the candidate experience worldwide? And what are the post-pandemic trends? I'm delighted to welcome Kevin Grossman back to the podcast as my guest this week. Kevin is president of the Talent Board, the organisers of the Candidate Experience Awards and ongoing global benchmark research into the candidate experience. He has a massive amount of data-based insight to share on how the candidate experience continues to evolve. Hi, Kevin, and welcome back to the podcast. Matt, thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. For people who who may not know you and know your work, could you just introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do? I would love to do that. So my name is Kevin Grossman, and I'm president of Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards. We have been doing benchmark research around recruiting, hiring, and improving the candidate experience for over 11 years. I've been running the organization for nearly the past eight years, and every year hundreds of employers, big and small across industries around the world, participate in our benchmark research anonymously and confidentially, and then that aggregate data, we then analyze and release our insights and research reports and then do articles, webinars, the, the, the list goes on year round talking about recruiting, hiring, and candidate experience. Absolutely. And uh, I think it was almost almost exactly a year ago since you were last on the show. So it's almost becoming an annual event to get you on to, I love it. to talk about the data and, and what's going on in the, in the candidate experience. So I, mean, I suppose that's my first question, really. The latest set of reports came out recently, I think. How would you summarize where we are with the candidate experience now? Is it is it still getting better? How have things changed since since last year? So I'm going to answer that a mildly sarcastic way. Nothing and nothing to disparage you and the question at all. The thing that I always like to say first is that nothing's changed, good and bad. Nothing's changed about. And what I mean by that is that every year in our research, what we find is that the same key differentiators are what make the difference every year. Now, I will talk about differences that we, Matt, that we have seen in the data, and there definitely have been some, but communication and feedback loops. I mean, sometimes I I, I joke about this. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm an old man standing on my porch in my robe and you're all kids playing in my yard. And I'm like, nothing's changed. Get off my lawn. (laughs) <laughs> and I mean, but, and I say it that way because it is true though. Those are always the definitive differentiators, communication, feedback, transparency, expectation setting. All of these things drive a higher level of perceived candidate fairness and positive sentiment. It is the hardest thing for companies to do year after year, every single time. So that, so now that I got that out of the way, Um, in regards to what is the same every year, there's definitely been some very interesting fluctuations. I mean, we've seen a lot of changes since, especially since the pandemic started, because pre-COVID, we were measuring 
candidate experience than nothing but a growth market for a long time. In fact, when Talent Board was first founded by Jerry Crispin, Elaine Orler, and Ed Newman, and I was one of the early volunteers, we were coming out of the Great Recession. It, ever since that point, all the way through 2019, it was pretty much a growth market. And then, you know, everything, the bottom fell out from underneath us. And then some, what we found though, I think some, some of the trends that we found were things that were just accelerated by the pandemic and where we're at today. So for example, um, resentment has actually always been something that we, what we call candidate resentment we've measured in our data. It's the percentage of candidates who said they'll never do anything again with an employer based on a poor experience. And in North America, it's always been the highest, followed by EMEA. And then APAC and Latin America have always been the lowest in regards to resentment. Well, resentment fell through the through the floor in 2020 because employers were suddenly in this place of like, what do we do to keep the business moving forward? So there was a lot more empathetic communication happening with not only their candidates, but employees too. And candidates were more forgiving at, at that, you know, in 2020, there were millions of people out of work because of the pandemic. And then that all changed again in 2021 when hiring came back with a, with a vengeance, actually. And then we saw resentment rise again, especially in North America and EMEA. And then that had just continued through last year in the 2022 data too. So, and it's up globally actually um, everywhere. Now it's still a smaller percentage compared to the overall candidate responses that are representative of all candidates in our data. So for example, in North America, it was 12% who said that they'll never do anything with the company again. But when you project that out, that could be quite significant. Um, it's 11% in EMEA. It's lower in APAC in Latin America. And just a quick note, what we found, what's interesting about the reason why resentment's lower in those, one of the reasons why it's lower. Many of the countries in, in Latin America and APAC, um, candidates culturally are less likely to share negative feedback. And it's something that we don't measure exactly, but we know we've heard from the candidates and the employers who are hiring in those regions that that is the case. So there is a positive halo effect skew actually in the data, especially in APAC. That does not include Australia and New Zealand markets, though those markets are, kind of reflect more West, Western um, resentment that we see. But some of the other parts of APAC, Asian cultures in particular, and the same thing in Latin America. So but overall, though, unfortunately, what we call candidate resentment is up. And does that indicate, you know, is that purely sort of based on the, the market that we were looking at last year? Is it companies behaving differently? Have you got any insight into what, what might be driving that? So many people have gone through their own existential crisis, right, the past three years. Like, what, what am I doing? Do I really want to keep doing this job? And that's true for whether it was hourly employees. I mean, there's still, you know, two and a half million people in the U.S. workforce that haven't even re have never returned to work. And it, it has economists scratching their heads like and labor experts like, why? Where are they at? Where did they go? They're not hiding on an island somewhere. But I think that everybody, you know, the, the employees leaving in droves, and I'm not going to call it the great resignation. I'm sorry, I even said the words. <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> I know it's too late now. But I mean, people just, you know, like I want something different. I want to do something different. And so what, but what we found is that we actually, candidates have told us and through our data that communica communication and feedback loops in general have gotten worse. Now, there are high performing companies and high rated companies in our research every year. Those are the ones that win our awards that we call the candies or the candidate experience awards that are above average ratings. We do have those, but it's still, it's the majority of the candidates this last year have set uh, communication and feedback breakdowns, actually things taking much longer to, I mean, I'll give you a, a, an example, a best practice that we see in the highest rated companies every year is that at the point of application candidates who are not qualified are more likely to be dispositioned within three to five days. And that, and with it at the most one to two weeks. And that is good because if they are not qualified, you should tell them and let them know and focus on the people you want to screen and hire, period. End of sentence. Don't hold on to people until you fill a wreck because that could be weeks or months later. 
And that just adds to, again, the resentment. And when I, and again, another thing just to be clear about, when I say resentment, I mean candidates who are not willing to ever apply again, refer others, have any brand affinity, or if you're a consumer business, be a customer even. That's something that we've been measuring for a long time. So that's one, one specific example. Um, and what, unfortunately, what we found in, in our data is that a third of all the candidates this last year still had not heard back about any next steps at all, or they, or they claim not being dispositioned or rejected, one to two plus months after they applied. And that's up from the year before. So it was actually, the, the, the pandemic has started to decline a little bit, but that's still a lot of people. When you project that out to the global candidate market, a third of the candidates are not hearing back after almost two plus months. I mean, that's that should not be happening, especially for those. We know the many that are not qualified when they're applying for a job across job types, hourly, professional, management, doesn't matter. Let them know, the unqualified folks. Absolutely. To, I suppose to focus in on the the, the positives here, um, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, every year you recognize companies who, who, who are doing this and, you know, who are doing this well, or at least doing this above, you know, above, above average. Who, who are some of the employers that have stood out in the last 12 months? So every year we, again, the companies that are above average in ratings, it's not just about the top 10 or the top 25, because what we wanted to do early on when this program was put together was to recognize those that are just, that are raising the bar, period, that are above average. So to give you an example of some of the, the companies and the brands this last year that are, they're not necessarily doing it right all of the time, they're doing more of the things that we see across the, the candidate journey better most of the time. They're more consistent with how they deliver recruiting and hiring. So when we look at even, well, some of the highest rated companies from this last year include the Hogue Memorial Presbyterian Hospital, for example, D2L, which is a learning company, Appeal Sciences. A lot of, one of our big segments is, is also healthcare. So New York Presbyterians, um, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, Virtuso, which is, a, uh, and they've been one of our global winners, ConAgra Brands. The, they are, they, and that's just to list some of the names, Walgreens, Inspire Brands. I mean, the list goes on. They are doing, for example, they are the dispositioning within three to five days, for example. They are ensuring that, and one of the biggest, I'll tell you, on the positive side, I know I was going negative for a little bit there, Matt. So on the positive side, one of the biggest differentiators every year, and especially the highest rated companies, some of those which I have just named, they are giving feedback to finalists. This is a big positive differentiator every single year. It's something that all candidates want, right? We want to hear why you're not going to pursue me. Give me some feedback. And even for those who get hired, I mean, usually they're the ones that will get the feedback and because they are going to come on board. But those who have made it to final stages and are not going to be pursued, giving them some specific job fit qualification status every single year is a huge differentiator. In fact, the highest rated companies are, are doing it so much more often that they have a 50% higher willingness to refer net promoter score, meaning their candidates are 50% more likely to refer others. And they still didn't get the job at the end of the day. That's, it is, and it's not a direct correlation. There's just too many variables that are involved in across the candidate journey, but it's this very strong relationship. If they're, that's one of the key things that they're doing. And a lot of, I know a lot of organizations around the world, there, there is a, you know, legal counsel worries about what you tell candidates. And I, I just did a workshop at a conference that was, uh, it was a great workshop. And one of the questions that came up is like, well, I, I understand about feedback, but you know, what if, if it comes to the cultural fit and like, how would we position that they just, I'm like, you don't say any of that, please. <laughs> don't talk about cultural fit. No, that's not the kind of feedback that we're talking about. Cause that's where you can, that's where you can get in trouble. What we're talking about is, did they have the experience skills that you were looking for or not? Or if they, and if you weren't, if they didn't have it, then let them know why. And it's not, it doesn't even have to be framed as a negative. It can be framed as we recommend you go do X, Y, and Z, and then maybe apply for some of these other jobs, make a recommendation. 
and uh, and technology and recruiting and automation can help do that now too. Besides the human interaction, I can recommend other jobs. I can stay, you know, in contact with you and nurture you. But it's the, that feedback is is one of the biggest differentiators every single year in our research. You also mentioned in the research the importance of a of a fair interview process. What does that actually mean? Well, so fairness is very subjective. We know that, especially as it relates to how we or we're framing it. So we do ask the candidates a variety of questions about each stage, including the the screening and interview process. And we ask them, how fair do you think the interview process was? Well, fairness can vary depending on how I feel during the day, right? And we know that. But what we also know is when companies are adhering to a structured interview process, so so just big picture, it is a consistent process and a set of questions that I'm asking candidates regardless of job type. I mean, it may vary by job type, but every candidate is has the same experience um, with the recruiters, with the hiring managers, and we are adhering to that so that we are, it also, not only does that, is that a, more of a fair process, having a structured process, it also helps, we would argue, with selection, making better selection decisions. Um, it can help reduce bias. It doesn't remove bias. Nothing can. Nothing has done that yet. Not even technology. It helps to reduce bias, and it it is definitely the perceived fairness is quite dramatic. In fact, the when overall the highest rated companies in our research, they definitely are focused more on a, a structured interview process. They tell us this, and their overall candidates willing to re- willingness to refer increases over a hundred percent when it comes to interview fairness again subjective but we know that if they're they're doing this they're doing a lot of the things as well around that that make a, make a biggest difference but again a structured interview process consistent across job types makes a big difference and in, in a timely fashion too right and it's and we're not, and we're talking about more of a limited number. We, we find that as the number of interviews stretch to four or five plus and beyond, the there is definitely a negative relationship in ratings. Sentiment begins to drop dramatically the more interviews a candidate says they had at the end of the day. So, but anyway, structure, a structured interview process. And, and really, these are also companies, Matt, by the way, that are have embedded and have SLAs with their hiring managers, trying to get them to adhere to their this structured process. It makes a big difference in, in the screening and interview process at the end of the day. One of the topics that's been coming through from a number of the people that I've spoken to this year is TA's role in internal mobility. What about internal candidates? How are the sort of the best companies dealing with those? So what we find is that There has been a movement in what I'll call our candy community, and not just with the high, the companies that are above average in ratings, but to trying to differentiate that experience. I mean, because the focus has shifted more to retention, you have to, and I've always said you have to constantly re recruit to retain individuals. And companies have not necessarily done a really good job of that. I mean, you just look at the numbers of how many people have left the past two years. There and continue to leave companies that they no longer want to be at for whatever reason that is. And so the, the, the candidates themselves at the end of the day, the internal candidates, there is more differentiation that's starting to happen. I mean, we find in our data and research that internal candidates definitely get more feedback, not even at the finalist stage, just across the board than external will ever, will ever, ever get in our data. Internal always gets more attention. There's more interaction with the hiring managers internally, and as it should be, because again, this is about a this is a retention issue at the end of the day. And companies that are more willing to not have fiefdoms in regards to like I don't want to lose the this person in my division, so I'm not going to share. I'm not going to be supportive of this internal move. Those that are more, I mean, it's it's about retention for the greater business good at the end of the day. So there is more feedback and attention paid to internal candidates, but there's not a lot of differentiation on the upfront, on the front end, though, not yet, at least when it comes to applying. 
early on. Sometimes um, it is the, it's almost this, maybe the same application process that external candidates have. the The internal career sites are um, haven't are not that good overall, but. I think that there's definitely been a focus uh, and attention. And I know we're actually starting a, a pilot program about the internal candidate experience, kind of a, as an, a, an addendum to our core benchmark research that we're going to experiment with some companies this year and see if it's something that more companies want to focus on. And so far, I think that is the trend. Again, it's a big focus on retention. And, and, that, and what relates to that, Matt, too, with the internal experience, it's also why what everybody, what we're calling pre-boarding now. So that time between accepting the offer and starting the new position, um, whether I'm an internal or external candidate, there's a lot more in, uh, of resources being applied to that group. And that is, we find that the more nurturing and engagement you can give those hires before they start that new position, um, the more likely they are to be in that position, at least out of the gate. But in, the internal focus has definitely been something that we're, we're hearing more about and companies that are wanting to differentiate to, to help improve retention. And I'm glad to see that HR is partnering more with TA to, to do this. It's not like a handoff. And now I don't, as a, in TA, I don't touch this anymore. Again, you're having to re-recruit to retain. Absolutely. So as a final question, what do you think we can expect to see in terms of candidate experience in 2023? And I suppose there's, there's two there's two aspects to this. I mean, first of all, there are a number of sectors that are experiencing layoffs at the moment, and you know that's having a direct effect on lots of talent acquisition teams. At the same time, with things like chat gpt ai seems to have moved right in the center of everyone's everyone's radar so what effect do you think the continuing economic uncertainty but also the rapid development of technology are going to have on the candidate experience over the next sort of 12 to 24 months i've never claimed to be a soothsayer matt <laughs> at all but i but i can tell you what i what i think is going to happen and again we'll see what happens in in our core benchmark data and, and other projects that we're focused on, like the internal experience. But I think that a lot of companies have been hitting the brakes, even those who aren't laying off. Hiring has slowed, although we are starting a kind of a, a monthly pulse research survey, and we're going to release the, the first results this next week and do it on a monthly basis that the companies that have responded so far are still mostly hiring. And, and only a smaller percentage said they've laid off and frozen. Yes, we've seen in the media the tech layoffs. They, they, there will be layoffs that continue. Companies are kind of riding the brakes. Um, hopefully, we're not going to hit gridlock on the highway right now. But I, wor I do worry, though, one of the things that also impacted this, and I'm sure you know this, too, with a lot of the organizations that you talk to and work with, there's been a lot of churn in TA and recruiting whether they've been laid off or folks that are just, they're fried, they're burnt out. CA leaders are uh, have been burnt out. They're, they're leaving their jobs. They're going to other jobs. So a lot of, I mean, we, the, just anecdotally, we have companies that are going to participate in our research again this year that maybe even have won a candy in the past. And they have, there's no historical knowledge of that. Like it, that, like the team is completely new. And when we tell them that, they're like, oh, we didn't know that we participated. And we're kind of hearing that more and more. So I think that's going to be, that's going to ultimately, because we find that the hardest thing that we see for companies to do is sustaining a quality recruiting and hiring a candidate experience over time. It's the hardest thing that we've seen. And all these things that are impacting the business, including the, the current economy right now, I worry we'll, we'll continue to see resentment kind of simmer and maybe even increase again in 2023 because of just poor communication and feedback loops. With, with the exception, again, of the, the, the above average rated companies in our research, I think that's going to be more of the, unfortunately, more of the norm. And I, I hope, though, I have a hope that there will be this renewed focus, though, on on retention, on the internal experience and make improvements there. But when you have, I mean, if you have changes in the business leadership, changes on the, the HR and recruiting team, changes in your own recruiting team, 
merger and acquisition activity, the list goes on. It's it, it sets companies back, I would argue. And as it relates to what we measure, it does. And I kind of worry we're going to see more of that this year. And do you think technology will make a difference? I think technologies already have made a difference. I'm a big proponent of of smart recruiting technologies, especially AI related machine learning, natural language language processing. I mean, I know that in our data and research, it, when candidates are getting communications where there was none before, and that's usually because of automation, there is a positive sentiment to that. They Candidates want to be engaged and communicated with. Everybody wants to talk to a human. Most won't, especially early on at the point of application. But it, it will make a difference in, with communication, yes. But at the end of the day, those people that you're actually getting to the screening and interviewing and hiring – that's where more human interaction must happen still. And this, where there's a greater investment between the candidates and the employers, that's where I would argue companies have more to lose. If you make, if I apply and I'm just not qualified, I'm going to be mad probably that I, maybe I didn't hear back or you told me that you're not going to pursue me. I want to get feedback. You're not going to get feedback if you apply and you're not qualified. It's just not going to happen. And I empathize with all the candidates with this, but that's just that's the reality. Um, if I, but if I make it in the running and I'm getting to, you know, second, third, final interviews and may, maybe still fall short of getting the offer, there's, there's, there needs to be some exchange of why at that point. And that's the thing I hope companies try to double down on. Um, at the end, but automation definitely w- it will continue to help. I've been playing with Chat GPT. I know a lot of folks in our industry have been talking about it. It's fascinating. I think that there's some amazing use cases. I think anything that helps to improve communication and get content started for your recruiting and hiring efforts, um, and I, I think it it's great. There's there's some things that I'm still, you know, a little concerned about the impact on critical thinking, but that's another podcast for another time, Matt. But I mean, otherwise, I, I think automation definitely will help, but we can't, the people that you're screening and interviewing, making offers to and pre-boarding, they, they, you've got to double down on that investment. Kevin, thank you very much for talking to me. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. My thanks to Kevin. Just before we end the show, I just want to say how excited I am to be attending Unleash at Caesars Forum in Las Vegas in a couple of weeks' time. Please come and say hello if you're there, and I'll be doing some live podcasting from the expo floor. If you haven't yet got your ticket, if you go to unleash.ai slash unleash America, that's unleash.ai slash unleash America, you can use the discount code Recruiting Future 20. ATT dash SH. That's Recruiting Future 20 ATT dash SH to get a 20% discount. You can subscribe to this podcast in Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or via your podcasting app of choice. Please also follow the show on Instagram. You can find us by searching for Recruiting Future. You can search all the past episodes at recruitingfuture.com. On that site, you can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Recruiting Future Feast, and get the inside track about everything that's coming up on the show. Thanks very much for listening. I'll be back next time, and I hope you'll join me. This is my show. Attracting, recruiting, and retaining great talent has never been harder. But why? We know we need them, and they need us. So why are we making it harder? Pull up a chair, listen, and laugh along with Alyn Bailey and Tracy Parsons as they dissect the industry, solve problems, and scoff at and sass the status quo. Join the rebellion with the Talent Rebelcast and question everything you know about the world of work.